All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, some announcements before we start. We'll send you an email with all this information anyway, so and maybe some of you already know this. But if you want to do a semester or master's project next semester, so in the autumn semester in the quantum information theory group, there will be an information event tomorrow afternoon uh, at 4.45 in this room, HPV G5, and it will also be streamed. So either on Zoom or on the live streaming of the room, like the TH live streaming. Uh, so just go to the Quantum Information Group website and check it tomorrow at some point to, so that we know um, which, how to watch it if you want to watch it online. Okay. Uh, and the way it works is that tomorrow there will be a presentation of the topics and areas and different group members that can supervise people. And then you have about a week to apply and all the, um, all the information is on the website. Okay. But you should apply by the 10th of May. Uh, the other thing that we also sent an email about is that the Quantum Foundation Summer School registrations are open, and this you can, you can go through this foundations.eth.ch website. Uh, and we're also looking for volunteers from ETH to help with several tasks, and those people would get to go for free. Uh, good. So today we will continue talking about coherence and thermal operations, and this will be the final lecture in resource series for now. Uh, so we'll talk more about asymmetry and asymmetry monotones, then we'll see about how thermal operations relate to this, and then we'll talk a little bit about coherence and work as resources. But first I'll just recap what we did before. And apologies for writing in red, but I think it's the strongest marker we have. So let me just recap what we did before. So, so we had the resource theory of asymmetry with respect uh, with respect to some group G and the rep and its representation. G, where, what were the allowed operations? These were the covariant maps. So these are the trace preserving completely positive maps, E such that they commuted Um, sorry, U, normal U, G. No, that's right, U, G. Okay. And then we saw that the free states from here were the states that were symmetric, right? So these were the, the states that were not changed by uh, the action of any group element. Say we're in a subsystem S. Okay, and these are called symmetric states. Uh, and then we looked at one monotone that was a symmetry. Which was just the um, the relative entropy or divergence between rho s and this twirled version of rho s. Which is just an average over all group elements of this, right? Which as we saw, like this is a free state. This is called the twirling operator the resulting is a free state, and it's in fact is the closest free state to our original state. Okay, so this is all we did last time. Then we saw that some conserved, conserved quantities were powers of the, of the generator, G, 
can uh, greater of this. Uh, and and one example was the if our group is just R and we're talking about UG being the time evolution by some time T, then the generator of this is the Hamiltonian, which means that any power of the Hamiltonian is a conserved quantity. So the energy is a conserved quantity. Okay. So let me just write here some examples also to motivate a bit why we care about this. One was time translation symmetry, and this is the one we'll look at now. And this is when G is just R. And we have some Hamiltonian, that's a generator. And U T of some row S is just E. Sometimes I forget the H bar. Uh, Right. And then the free states are um, the diagonal states in these energy bases, which means that they commute with the Hamiltonian. Okay. What does this correspond to? I mean, it's it's a it's a resource theory where we don't have um, where we don't have time control, so we don't, or we have lack of time information. And Ralph will talk more about this when he talks about clocks in the final part of the lecture. Okay. But one can also think of taking g equals so three, and then it's more like space symmetry. And th there's a whole theory of quantum reference frames. So this corresponds to, for example, I don't know which way is up or down. I'm inside a lab, and I don't, I don't have a, an external reference frame that tells me what the direction is. So all my, all my allowed operations, because I don't know what the, um, it, what my overall orientation is, they must, they commute with any rotation in 3D. Right, so so it's always like, oh, I know I apply this transformation up to a general rotation because I, I don't know in which way I'm moving. Um, this actually has lots of applications in practice, uh, and if you want to know more about it, then Esteban Castro from our group will give a lecture on quantum reference frames uh, at the summer school. So you can come here to see this. Okay. So first we'll talk about other monotones, and this will also kind of bring together the monotones we've seen for the thermal operations. Okay, so. so alpha asymmetries, which this should look familiar depend on some parameter alpha, and is defined as the divergence, the quantum divergence, the quantum Rennie divergence between this. So I'll write here the definition of this, and it's a bit clunky. So these are the alpha uh, Rennie. Quantum relative entropies or divergences and it's just a generalization of what you did for in a tutorial for the classical case now I'll put them all here. So in principle, it should be like 
a formula that is continuous on this parameter alpha, so alpha can go from zero to plus infinity. Okay, and they are defined classically. They have lots of nice properties. So for example, I'll show you later. We can derive the conditional entropies from here, and just entropy measures in general. They have a bunch of nice properties. So people try to generalize them to the quantum case. In fact, one of the people who worked on this the most was Marco Tomamichel, who gave the other lectures. Um, so the thing that works is going to be this. So for, I'll omit the subscripts from now on, okay? For alpha equals zero is this thing. So you, can, you project uh, sigma into the support of rho and take the log of that. And that's just the limit case when, when alpha goes to zero of the following. Log of trace of rho s alpha, rho alpha, one minus alpha. So this is when alpha is smaller than one. This is very similar to the classical case. Now, when it's one, you take the limit. You did this, I think, for the classical one, at least, in the tutorial. And it becomes uh, trace of rho and then log of rho minus log of sigma when alpha equals one. And then for alpha larger than one, you'd think it would be similar to this, but because maths, we need to do a bit more gymnastics, and it's, it turns out that the thing with the right properties uh, is this thing. So trace of rho s, oh, sorry, rho sigma 1 minus alpha over 2, rho sigma minus alpha over 2 alpha, to alpha, all of this to the power of alpha. And this is when alpha uh, up is positive or is larger than one. And then when it's one, when, when it's infinity, one takes the limit and then it's just log of min of some coefficient such that makes, um, yeah, it tells you like how, how much bigger can I make sigma such that it's still, sorry, how much smaller can I make sigma so that it's still larger than, than rho s. By this, I mean that if I take the difference, this, this operator would be negative. So this is for alpha equals plus infinity. <laughs> so this is just a definition, looks a bit dry. The key thing is that you, they found that these two are the right definitions and they take the limit and find all the other ones. So why do we care? Well, we care because they're all monotones here and we'll see that they're monotones in more general resource series, depending on what you put here in the sigma place. But let me just tell you some familiar examples to see how to relate this to something we know. One is that if you take sigma s to be the fully mixed state on s, okay? And remember that this is the, for example, this is the free state of noisy operations, then what do we get? We get that d0 of rho sigma is minus the h max of rho s, okay? Minus log of the rank of rho s. Okay. Good. 
because look, this is a this is like the identity times some constant, and th the projector into the into the it's just a projector into the support of row. So it will give you that. So it gives you the rank of row and then cost logarithms and so on. If you take d1, one always recovers the von Neumann things. So tip, which is minus. Good. And if one takes the infinity one, one gets minus the h min. Uh, plus log of the maximum eigenvalue. This is what I mean by this, maximum eigenvalue of rho. Okay. So we can see already like how we have this very general definition, and now by plugging in something on, on the right, we get the familiar entropies, entropy measures. Um, if instead of this, we'll see later, we plug in here the thermal state, we'll get out some, some free energies, which we'll see in a bit. But the other example is that you, one can get the conditional entropy measures that you've also seen in QIT. So you remember the, this idea, entropy of system A given access to system B for a global state rho AB. Uh, and this is just minus D of putting rho AB on one side and identity on the other side. So if you go on to study anything in quantum information theory, you come around, you come across uh, these entropies, and it's very nice to see that everything is is derived from them. Okay. Uh, why? So they are designed such that they've, and, and then of course one can define smoothed versions of this in the same way that you did in in uh, QIT. So why this, the first property that all of them have, and we'll not prove this here, is that they're contractive. Under maps, CP, CPMs, this means If you apply some up to something, this can always can only decrease. Okay, this is true for all rows, sigmas, and and alphas, which tells you already that they're going to be monotons. They're going to be candidates to monotons, right? So, um, and then it's like. It's like a distance measure. They work more or less like a distance measure, but an asymmetric one, uh, which I'll write over here. Kind of asymmetric distance measure, by which I mean so This is always larger than zero. It's zero if it's the same state. Um, but in general, it's not symmetric. So if I put, if I change, of course there are some states for which this will be true, but in general it's not the case. Um, so there are resources, uh, sorry, there are results in general series of resource series that tell you that anything that has these properties, if you do, if you consider a monotone that is a relative, uh, that is, you define as some relative distance of the state to the closest state in the set of free states, uh, this is always going to be 
a monotone for well-behaved resource series, which is, uh, you know, it, it's something that people are working on and try to weaken the conditions for what it means to be well-behaved. Uh, good. So that's monotones in general, and I, I wanted to write it down explicitly because we'll see that later this will also apply to thermal operations. Now, something else that I will not prove, but I'll send you the resources of how to prove it, is that there is a Steinspring dilation for maps in general, right? And there's a special type of Steinspring dilation for maps that are co uh, covariant with respect to a group. So I will do it here for the special case of this time translation uh, symmetry, but it's true more generally. It's just a bit more annoying to write. Okay, so. Dilation for time translation symmetric maps. Okay, so take, so we take that special case, HS, and we take a map that is. Uh, let's say, G covariant, and we know what it means. It means it commutes with time evolution. Then we can always write this map as a unitary on a larger system. But this unitary now needs to, to satisfy some conditions. So here it goes. There exists some larger system, which uh, in fact is finite. If my original system is finite, which has some Hamiltonian. And there exists some state on this system, which is a free state. And there exists some joint unitary on S and E, which needs to commute with the total Hamiltonian. Okay, so it's, it's uh, an allowed unitary such that Starts that we have the usual thing. And continue that here. Uh, such that the map on Rho S can be seen as trace over this environment of times A U S E W. Again, I'm not proving this. It requires a bit of group theory, which is um, out of the scope of the lecture, but I, I'll send you the reference for this. Okay. So this is very familiar. Uh, and in fact, it looks like thermal operations are just a special case of this, where we say, OK, we allow for all the operations of this form, but we just fix this state here to be a thermal state. Right? And Noisy operations are, again, the same, but we say, well, the Hamiltonian is all zero everywhere, and we fix this to be the um, uh, fully mixed state, right? So then, indeed, it looks like the relationship between the resource theory of asymmetry and the resource theory of thermal operations is that one is a subset of the other, right? The allowed operations, so, and this is a claim. So thermal operations are, uh, so thermal operations, a lot of operations, I think we call it big tau, is a subset of, of the 
time transition symmetric maps. Which means in particular that Uh, all the monotones that were monotones for this larger resource here of a symmetry are still monotones for this thing, right? Because before, if this is a monotone, it means if I can go from rho to sigma, then this asymmetry needs to decrease, right? And now it's the same, except I have access to even fewer operations. So it still must decrease, okay, if, if we show that this is true. So we have these asymmetry monotones as monotones of thermal operations. So let me... We need to prove this. I'll start erasing here. So I think you did this in the tutorial. Didn't you, you showed that uh, thermal operations are time symmetric, right? That they commute with time evolution. Did you do this, Daniel? I think so, yeah. You did in the tutorial that uh, thermal operations commute with the time evolution? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, this is very nice. Okay, so the only thing, the only thing you need to prove this claim is to show that, in that indeed this that any thermal operation commutes with the time evolution. Uh, G, we can call it T, right? <laughs> okay. Which means it doesn't matter what we do the thing before, after. You've seen the proof of this before? Did I repeat it for? Okay, it's a question. You've seen it before or do you want me to repeat it? You've seen it. Okay, good. Right, so this is done in the tutorial. It's also in these lecture notes that I'll upload. Uh, okay, so it's a very direct thing. Good. So now, as a consequence, we have the asymmetry monotones are also thermal monotones. And now this gives us a bigger picture of uh, what these different monotones are measuring. So suppose that these are all states, all states in a subsystem S, okay? And I start here with my row. And let's say that here in the middle, these are all the diagonal states, meaning incoherent. Okay, for now we assume a non-degenerate Hamiltonian. If it's degenerate, there's some subtleties, but it does not uh, how much that. And then down here, it's going to be the thermal state. Okay, T associated with some temperature, right? Which is our free state. So what the asymmetries measure is kind of some distance 
between my state, which can be a coherent, and the defaced version of the state, right? D of rho is just uh, applying the twirling, but we use this notation before for thermal operations, that is a defaced state. Okay. So this is kind of what the this is symmetry monotones measure. Okay. And what the classical free energies that we looked at before measure is this thing here. So I'll write, I'll write it here F, well, I'll write it here delta F of, of the defaced state. Uh, I'll, I'll write the definitions in a bit, okay? And both of these things are monotone, so in order to know if I can transform a state rho to a state sigma, for example, I'm going to need to know, uh, let's put here the D of sigma, okay? Not only this blue vertical line needs to be larger um, for rho than for sigma, but also this distance needs to be larger for rho than for sigma, right? Both the asymmetry uh, and the classical free energy. And we'll see a few more monotones in a bit. But this already gives us much more structure to this pre-order that we have on states. Okay, so for example, this transformation would not be allowed. So this transformation is not allowed because um, the asymmetry of rho is smaller than the asymmetry of sigma. Okay. And this is the example, for example, uh, of I said that you cannot transform state one to the state plus, even though the free energy of one is larger than the free energy of, um, of plus. Okay. okay. So I'll write this down a bit more explicitly. Yeah. Which is that necessary conditions for being able to take rho into sigma and This, I'll, I'll define it properly in a second. Okay. So alpha larger than zero. This is like the classical free energy must be larger. And I'll define it in a second, but it's essentially the things that we've been seeing before. But also now we have this new condition that the asymmetry must also be larger. Okay. And I'm not saying that these are sufficient conditions. Okay. I don't think this is known in general. I think for qubit systems, uh, this is necessary and sufficient, and all the allowed transformations are very well characterized, but for larger systems, there's still a lot of uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, this is sigma. Yes. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Sorry, th this is just a reminder of what D of rho is. This is a defaced version of D, which is the same as applying the twirling to uh, to G, okay. to, to, sorry, to rho. And the, the reason is that before, when we talk only about thermal operations, we talked about this operator D of rho. And then when we talk about the symmetry in general, we introduce this more general twirling operator. And I'm just saying they're the same in this case. Okay. Yeah. More questions before we move on? Okay, so the example, 
that we've been talking about is that suppose I have, uh, say, a harmonic oscillator, and I have rho, which is a pure state at a very high energy E, so it's very high on the ladder, and I want it to go to state plus, which is just a superposition of the ground state and the first excited state, right? So it has way less free energy. So we have, we're going to have this. It's going to be much, much larger. F alpha. But the asymmetry of rho, this is going to be zero because the state is already diagonal is strictly less than the asymmetry of alpha, which is one or two, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Right, so this is a bit disturbing. So we have, we can have a state here full of energy, and we cannot transform it by thermal operations through just a superposition of, of zero plus one which is way less energy, right? Uh, and this really highlights that the only resource in thermal operations is not just work, because work would be this, but we also need some source of coherence. Right? In practice, if you talk to an experimentalist, they say, oh, of course we can do this transformation on the lab, uh, but that's because they have access to lasers, which are uh, a source of coherence. And there's a lot of research into, you know, how much we degrade sources of coherence. So if, in addition, I have like some this is my drawing of a laser. Um, so I have a superposition of all states, and this is my additional resource for coherence, how much it gets degraded when it, it's used to apply this kind of transformations. Okay. This is it's a cool area of research as well. OK, so what we have not defined these things yet properly. So let's define first the quantum case. The alpha free energy difference are just defined for some coefficient alpha, as you can imagine, as this Let's say rho. And the thermal state, and now we can put a constant here. It doesn't change anything. It still keeps it a monotone, but then it makes it more. Uh, it it matches some results when you're looking at special cases. For example, if now you're looking at Landauer's principle, uh, then this kind of thing will give you exact work costs and so on. Uh, so for and the classical uh, alpha free energy, this is the thing that we've been seeing before, which is Fc for classical alpha of rho s is just take the decohered state, the defaced state, and apply this. And this is exactly that thing that we've seen before. So it's this classical free energy for the vector of populations minus the same thing for the Gibbs state. So that so this is the general th thing, and it corresponds somehow, uh, take it with a grain of salt, to some kind of distance measure directly between this and this, between my state and the thermal state directly, instead of doing these two steps. And let me tell you exactly how. So in general, these things don't have nice properties like being uh, additive, 
But in the case of alpha equals one, as per usual, they do. Because here we are talking about the von Neumann entropies and free energies in general. Then we have F1, and normally we just omit the one and just say delta F or S. Then even for uh, general, general states that are not uh, diagonal, we get this. That is this difference in free energies, which we saw before was a monotone, right? And it, it characterized the conversion rate in the asymptotic case where this is the same thing that you've seen with Rolf. So it's the average entropy, uh, sorry, the average energy minus KT, the entropy. Okay, this is uh, von Neumann entropy. And in this case, we'll see after the break, that you can break this into two parts. So this is going to be exactly one contribution from the classical free energy, so this thing, plus one contribution from the asymmetry A of OS. So we'll see this after the break, but let me just tell you um, that you know that you think that oh now I have this this quantum monotone so maybe this is all I need to care about right? But this kind of examples tells us that precisely no you really need to care about this to access this vertical and horizontal axis individually because for example uh, in this case. So if you look at this case here, it's like your row, your row is here, okay? And your sigma is really down here. Right? So if you just look at the difference between, you know, that vector and that vector, it would look like, well, this, this, this free energy definitely goes down. But uh, if you look at just the asymmetry, it does not go down, so you cannot, you cannot do this state transformation. So after the break, we will uh, prove the thing. So we have seven minutes. Where is C at thirty-five plus? All right. So we want to prove this thing that at least for alpha equals one, we can split this quantum-free energy into a part that is just a classical one, so this horizontal axis, and the part that is the asymmetry. Okay. So. I think this is the only proof today. Ah, oh, no, it's not. Um, so I'll take this as an ingredient, as a building block, without proving it. But I can tell you the idea behind this. Tau is the thermal state. So why should this be true? Remember that the trace is basis independent, so we can write these things in whatever basis. So we just take the, the energy basis where this thing is already um, diagonal, right? And then if you're going to multiply it by something and then take the trace, the only values that matter of this something are the, are the diagonal eigenvalues, right? It's like I'm multiplying this matrix that has some things here, 0, 0 by something that has stuff everywhere. But then I only take the trace of this. Okay, so the only thing, the only values that are relevant from the first matrix are the ones in the diagonal. Okay. This is very hand sketchy and you can actually uh, prove it formally, but I'll, it's not important. 
Yes, this is a defaced version of this. So it's a matrix. It is a twirling. That's that's <laughs> that's what was there before. So the, this is the twirling of row S. This is a notation we used in the beginning of the lecture because we didn't talk about symmetry groups there, just defacing. Uh, now we see it in the context of this more general twirling. So yes, right. So it corresponds to when you do the twirling with the um, with the time evolution unitaries, what you get is just the just a diagonal matrix. So the, just the diagonal um, part of this. Okay. So we take that as an ingredient with that sketchy argument, and now we just go and prove it, and it's a bit. Uh, direct, so we just write the definition, K, T, S. I'll omit the sub. This is one, okay? But I'll omit the subscripts now. So now we just replace this with the definition, K, T of, for S equals one, this relative entropy was Rho and then log rho minus log tau, which, because the trace is well behaved, we can split into the two parts trace of rho, log rho, because the trace is linear, right? Minus trace of rho log tau, and now we just add zero. So we're going to add and subtract the same term, which will be related to that thing there. So we just say kt. Now we're going to add a bunch more terms here. So we have trace of rho log rho minus trace of Zero, zero, plus the same thing again. Log of zero minus the thing that was left. Uh, and now we use this this ingredient there. We use the ingredient to just replace the row with the deface version. And it's this term, right? So log of tau. Big bracket. Okay. Well, <laughs> but now this. It's just the definition. If you look at the definition of the relative entropy, this is again just the relative entropy between rho and the deface version of rho. Right. So we have kt, you know, s between rho and the deface version of rho plus kt. And again, here the same thing. Uh, sorry, the thing that is missing here is that because, again, this is diagonal in the energy eigenbasis, then I can replace here using the same trick. I can replace d of rho with rho, right? The only thing that this needs is that this state is diagonal, which is what's happening here. Okay, so now S of uh, D of rho and tau. But now this is, this was the definition of entropy of the asymmetry, so symmetry one of rho. And this is just, as we saw before, this is just a classical free energy. The classical one, if you want, of rho. Delta. Okay. 
and that's done. Uh, yeah, you've seen the definition of the of the relative entropies for different alphas. So you can imagine that we cannot just do this trick of just splitting into the two parts and then adding and subtracting um, something to, to get to the same result, which is why it doesn't work for alpha different than one. So. But at least here we see this, that for alpha equals one, so it's a necessary condition, we have this, uh, this monotone, and this monotone can be split into the asymmetry part and the uh, free energy part, the classical free energy. Okay. Questions? No? no, okay, so. One uh, consequence of this is that one cannot convert work to coherence or coherence to work without uh, help. So, either this way or that way. So the The no coherence from work, so no. This we've seen before, right? We cannot go from any state, any high energy state to any superposition of alpha, I don't know, E1 plus beta E2. Uh, and this is just directly due to the asymmetry monotones, right? Because the asymmetry of this is zero and the asymmetry of this is larger than zero. Okay. Uh, a of e, a of any coherent state. What is more surprising is that you also cannot do coherence from work, oh, sorry, uh, work from coherence. Because if you think what's a coherent state, again, think that I have a harmonic oscillator and I, I have some superposition of things here. Why can I not, I don't know, just just remove some, some energy overall from here and convert it into a uh, work that I store in a work battery in a state like this, but the proof is actually very simple. So, and what we'll show is the following, that if I have some row S in my battery, which can be this harmonic oscillator, my work battery, and I manage to convert this into garbage on S, so the thermal state on S, and some state of my energy, E of, I think before we use W for work, here, right? Then, if I could do this with the coherent state, then I can also do it with the decoherent state. Let's kill this marker. And, and before we prove this, what does this tell us? I mean, it tells us that I don't gain anything from the off-diagonal terms on row, right? They may as well not be there, so I can never... If I could not do this in the first place with the diagonal state, with the incoherent state, then no amount of coherence would, will allow me to do it. Right? Is it clear what this result means? Okay, so then the proof is very simple. It requires this ingredient that we proved in the first lecture that for all thermal operations, they always commute with this twirling or dephasing operator. 
thermal operation. Okay. And then I say, okay, so suppose that there is some operation that I apply to the initial state, my coherent state, and zero on my battery. That gives me the final state that I want. And then I can, of course, always discard this. Then in particular, the diagonal element of that thing, I mean, this is, this is a matrix. This is a matrix. So in particular, the diagonal elements of this matrix is, must be the same. So I just deface the whole thing. I'll forget subscripts here for a bit. But because E commutes with is defacing, this is E of defacing of zero times zero. And on the right, these things are already diagonal, right? The thermal state is diagonal, and this is a energy eigenstate, so it's also diagonal. So this doesn't do anything. And here, same thing, right? The Hamiltonian um, is a sum. It's not interactive, so this this part is already diagonal. So the only thing left to deface is this. So at epsilon of defacing of rho. And this is called sometimes uh, work clocking. Okay. How does one get around it? Well, like we saw before, you, you get around this by in the lab by adding a third system, which is your source of, of coherence, right? And then there are some funny resources, uh, results that say that, you know, this coherence is not that, not that degraded by this, by doing this kind of operations that transform, that extract coherence from here and transform it into work. Uh, but this is a whole other set of lectures. So. What this all tells us is that we really have these two resources in thermal operations that are, or in thermodynamics, if you want to say, that are independent, coherence and work, and that you need both in order to apply, um, if you want to do any state transformation. Which means that in, in particular, like, if you think back about currencies, and you want a currency that's universal, it's... Um, you need one of each at least, right? So you need to have both a source of work and a source of coherence, like for cooking, more than for you know, spending money, right? You need to have uh, flour and yeast in order to make bread, for example. How to characterize this? You know, then if you wanted to create a set of currencies for coherence, we really need to go a bit deeper um, into the coherence cost of transformations, and this would take a while and is also still an active area of research, so it wouldn't fit the lecture too well. Okay. So I'll just tell you some more remarks about this, and then we move on to the new topic, maybe today even. Okay, so one is, like I said before, for a qubit, all the allowed transformations are fully characterized. For larger systems, it's complicated, uh, but they are starting from this asymmetry uh, monotones, one can find tight bounds on, you know, if I want to go from rho to sigma, how much can I act on the off-diagonal terms? How big can they be? Right. So this is relatively uh, well characterized. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you about an alternative resource theory because it is very common in resource theories. Uh, 
in general when one wants to prove very general results. And it's not operational, but it can be useful. So let me tell you what this is. So alternative resource theory. So this is a free state preserving operations. And there's people who define resource theories in general like this, and they are wrong. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the red marker is very much gone. Maybe the blue still has no, no life in it. Maybe black. Okay. So what I wrote here is an alternative resource theory, which is a free state preserving operations. So that's the following. So we take one starts by defining the set of free states. And then one says that the allowed operations are the ones that respect this set of free states. This are uh, epsilon uh, such that if if tau belongs to the set of free states, then applying this is still a free state. Okay. Now, this is strictly more permissive. It has more operations in it than what we did before, which is start by saying, oh, well, these are the operational allowed operations. And from here, we find a set of free states. OK, this is a bigger set. So these are all the operations that only map free states to free states. So example, examples are Gibbs preserving operations. OK, so they say epsilon of the free state of the thermal state must be the thermal state again. So in this case, this free energy, in this case, so the, the quantum alpha free energies delta F alpha over are free are a complete set. family of monotons, which means that they characterize uh, <laughs> that they give us also sufficient condition for state transformations. And in particular, in particular, we can uh, create coherent states if you have a high enough um, energy thing, uh, energy eigenstate. OK, uh, so we can convert, we can trade between work and coherence. Okay. Because like we saw in the, in the case for, for the free entropy, now we just care about the sum of these two things. We don't care about the individual components. Okay. Another example is in theory of entanglement. So the operational thing is LOCC, local operations in classical communications. This comes from us thinking, we have two people, they're in their labs, they cannot do joint quantum operations, they can call on the phone and they can do local operations, right? This is the operational thing. Um, and then from here we say, oh, the free states are the separable states. And now what happens if you consider all the operations that preserve the, the, the set of separable states? This is a larger set, so this is... Uh, Entanglement, non-increasing maps. Okay, where F is a is the set of separable states. Okay. 
What's the problem with this resource theory? Is that it includes some operations uh, that you cannot implement through LOCC, right? That Alice and Bob would not be able to implement um, in practice. So it's not operational. Why do people study this kind of resource series a lot in general? Uh, one, because they're easier to prove theorems in, right? Because these things have usually very nice structures. So for example, it's immediate that, that then all these relative entropies to the set of free states um, come as, as monotones. And two is because you know, if something is impossible with these larger sets of operations, then it's also going to be impossible in the operational case, right? In, the, in thermal operations or in LOCC. Okay, so this is good for impossibility results. and for bounds in general. Like bounds on conversion rates, for example. If you can convert uh, two rows into three sigmas here using this, then you have to do, then if you restrict the set of operations, you can do at most as well as this. Okay. And this is the kind of, uh, of theories where you get these, resources, uh, these results like relative entropies are always a monotone. Good. But now one can go in the opposite direction and say, well, let's try to make thermal operations more operational. All right, so so for example, so far we allowed for unitaries uh, to be implemented for free as long as they commute with the with the with the global Hamiltonian red. But so we can just not allow for this. And why would you do this? Well because in practice what is a unitary you need to turn on some Hamiltonians right, tune them extremely well, time them extremely well when you turn them on and off and what parameters they have. So you could say, for example, that maybe I can choose the Hamiltonian for free, but all this time control that allows me to apply a unitary, this we need to pay for and you need to account for this, okay? if that makes sense. So this is the same as in this resource theory of Play-Doh of saying, well, no, I cannot just build any arbitrary shape. I need to account for, I don't know, the scale of the sculpture, or in the time needed to do this. Okay. Um, and this is something that Ralph will talk about because he'll talk about what is the, the actual cost uh, in terms of like clock systems and control systems that you need in order to apply a unitary. Okay. Uh, another thing that was very generous is that we allowed in thermal operations to say, well, we can bring in any buff, any Hamiltonian of your buff as long as it's in a thermal state. Right. But in practice, this is not easy to achieve in the lab. So we may say, well, uh, restrict, we can restrict uh, the thermal bath, Hamiltonian. And this will give us all sorts of finite size effects and finite size corrections to all these results like work costs and so on, which I think Rolf talked about a little bit. And the other thing that we can do is say, well, OK, so now we're studying nature. We accounted for energy and entropy, but in reality, if I'm talking about some concrete physical system, there might be other constraints. For example, I have angular momentum conservation, or I have particle number conservation, um, or spin. Okay, so we can add extra conservation constraints. So all of these things, what, what do they do? They take a set of allowed operations and they, now we only allow for subsets of this, of this larger set, right? So you get a more restricted theory, which means that you know, all the impossibility results still hold. All the monotones that we saw before still hold. They still need to be respected, but in addition, you get extra constraints. So 
And I want to talk a little bit more just about this, just to give you an overview of what's done here with multiple conserved quantities. By the way, this is something that uh, Rolf worked on and I've worked on and might be something that could be semester projects or master project for the autumn semester. So let's take just a simple example. So suppose that I care about, uh, yeah, sorry, the black is also dead, so I'll, I'll use dark green. Suppose you care about uh, angular momentum conservation. Okay. And in the simplest case, ah, oh, thanks. Do you also have black? Thanks. Uh, okay, so f so suppose that for now we don't care about energy, so the Hamiltonian is zero everywhere. Oh, this is very good, right? Okay, and now just say that oh, we allowed for allowed operations that conserve that conserve say. Uh, U S E, the same thing as before. We see what we put here. We'll see what we put here uh, in the environment. U S E. Now we can demand, for example, that U S C commutes with total angular momentum, or we can say that, oh, it must. And we can add this. Oh, it also commutes with angular momentum in the direction z, for example, right? So it just says that we, we are really accounting for all the angular momentum changes, so we, don't, we say this is a preserved quantity, we cannot, uh, we cannot change this, right? And here, one can ask, oh, what can we put here? And I don't know if Ralph told you, yes, Ralph told you about several ways of deriving the thermal state, right? And one of these was this passivity and complete passivity arguments, right? So what is the one state that we can put here that doesn't render the whole theory completely trivial, right? And, and this turned out to be of the form exactly like the thermal state. So for example, tau E, depending on some parameter beta, is E to minus beta L. Let's see. Okay, this is the case where I have, uh, I just care about conservation this time, divided by the normalization. Okay. So, this to tell you what, there's nothing special about energy except for its relation to uh, time, time translation that we saw before. But one can derive a resource theory that is, you know, pretty much mathematically is the same as we saw before, right? The only thing that changes is what's the interpretation of this operator here. Now it's the operator for angular momentum instead of the Hamiltonian. Okay. Uh, and in this case, one recovers exactly all the monotones as in thermal operations. And one can, uh, someone called Joan Vaccaro, uh, she, she found exactly Landauer's principle for, uh, for angular momentum, right? So, now my resources is, for example, a collection. Instead of a work battery, I can have a collection of spins pointing in one direction. This is my spin battery. Okay? And then how much of this spin battery do I need to spend in order to erase one qubit? Okay? And then it turns out to be uh, one over beta, and then uh, age of this, right, kitty, 
age of this, and of course that then one can put here uh, the right uh, the right alphas for the work cost and yield, right? So it gives you the zero and infinity here. Okay, and so you see, for one from one conserved quantity, we recovered something that is a uh, this parameter that we can change that corresponds essentially to an to a, an inverse temperature. Yeah. And now one can think, oh, what if now I have multiple conserved quantities? So now I have. Quantities. So say I have uh, the energy, the angular momentum, the particle number, and so on. Okay. Then, just like in traditional thermodynamics, we you had this from canonical state, I think. This generalized Gibbs state. One can do exactly the same. So you get e to minus. Beta one, a one. So this is the operator corresponding, like the Hamiltonian or the angular or the z angular momentum for this operation. Plus so minus beta two, a two. Plus beta k, a k. And then we normalize it, and the normalization factor is the we call it the the partition function, right? So now. So this is T of the bus. So again, we say now that the allowed operations are this, but they must commute not just with one operator here, not just the Hamiltonian or the angular momentum, but with all of this, right? So we say that uh, is of rho s is trace over the environment of u s e. And now rho s tau e uh, us e dagger. But then we demand that u s e must commute with these conserved quantities. S e, let me just write here s i, okay. on the whole system. For all of them. Okay. So again, you say this, we leave this empty for now, then it turns out that the only states that you can put here that don't render the, the theory trivial are states of this form, which are very familiar. Okay. So now we have a bunch of temperatures. Inverse temperature associated with AI which is derived from, I mean, it depends on, uh, just like the temperature depends on the average energy of the bus, this depends on the average value of this thing in the bus, right? And then, almost directly by definition, I think you already have all the ingredients to prove this, that these free energies, uh, sorry, of rho, as alpha of rho s and this tau s that these are monotones. Okay. This comes almost directly. And now, can we do the same thing as before of thinking about yield and cost of resources and having different batteries to store all these things? Uh, it depends. So if all these quantities commute with each other, then it's very simple. So if, if all of them commute, then yes, then, then we can have different batteries for different types of resources, and we can find ways to translate between them, which is extremely cool. Uh, and one can even find um, a nice expression for this for alpha equals one. 
df1 of for s is like before uh, this difference in free energy between my state and the thermal state, and the free energy then is defined just like you've seen in classical thermodynamics of, um, well, maybe you've not seen it in particle. Rho minus age of rho. Okay. So what is this? This is just trace of AI rho. Okay. So it's, it's the equivalent to the average energy, right? Average energy times some factor minus the entropy. This is what was the case in the, in the standard free energy. And if you have multiple conserved quantities, and then you get in the same way that um, you have like a sum of all these energies for the different quantities, the average value of the things. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, if, if they don't commute, which in general they might not, then it's complicated. <laughs> so one can still say things like, oh, one can still derive things like the second law saying that maybe the amount of energy work that I can extract from the system plus the amount of angular momentum work that I can extract from the system, this all must be smaller than the than the free energy difference. This is done, but finding this, um, this independent batteries for the different currencies, this is, this is much trickier because, you know, if they don't commute, it means that you cannot store just one thing. In the case of, say, angular momentum, and think of the case of angular momentum and energy. If they commute, it means that I can have an, a battery for, uh, for energy which is just a harmonic oscillator, and there's no, say that there's no spin involved here, and then I can have a battery for, um, for spin, which is a bunch of qubits that are fully degenerate, so they don't store any energy, but what they can store is like spin up or spin down, right? So here I only store spin, here I only store energy, everything uh, works nicely. If these quantities do not commute, then I cannot do this as simply, right? And this is an open area of research, how we characterize this kind of situations. Right. So this is more of an overview of our resource series in general. There's nothing special about thermodynamics. You can do the same for, um, yeah, for LOCC. Just take LOCC and now introduce more constraints on top of it, and you'll get uh, similar results. Okay. So then I think this might be a good place to stop. And then oh, tomorrow we start already with the other part of the lecture, which is about puzzles and paradoxes, and there's nothing to do with this. So thank you. And if you have questions, come to me now or in the office hours. <laughs>